see if we could find a place to live and uh, went into Motorola's personnel department. They told me that I was going to start uh, in a department on Augusta Boulevard, but soon my department was going to be transferred to their, uh, their main facility in Schaumburg. So we went and rented an apartment where we could look out our patio door and I could see the Schaumburg plant. And the first day I drove through all the, all the heavy traffic in Chicago to get to Augusta Boulevard. And uh, in the afternoon at coffee break, I was getting to know some of the people that I was working with. And one of them said, so, what do you think about moving to Florida next year? And I said, gee, I thought we were moving to Schaumburg in a month or so. I said, well, no, the things have changed. They, uh, they, they're building a facility in Fort Lauderdale we're going to be the first engineering group to go to Florida. So uh, for a year, I drove through the traffic of Augusta Boulevard and hated every minute of that, but, uh, <clears throat> but I suffered through it. Anyway, the group that I, uh, that I was working with was called Paging Engineering, and we were developing a new paging product. Uh, the pagers from, at that period of time were uh, uh, a pretty large, clunky piece of equipment. And we were working on a newer, lighter version. We were developing a, a pager that used hybrid thick film and thin film technology with custom integrated circuits. And uh, in fact, when we put the product into production, it was the first commercially produced uh, electronic product in the United States that used hybrid thick film, thin film technology. We picked up the technology from the, from the aerospace industry and uh, did what we needed to do to, uh, to, uh, to make it uh, uh, mass producible rather than, build, uh, than onesie twosie. Uh, I designed several pieces of it. This, this is the pager. You've probably seen it a number of years ago. It's 40 years old, but, but uh, that was the latest technology back then. It was called Page Boy 2. Uh, I designed the, uh, the antenna and I designed uh, some of the, uh, the front end radio frequency uh, portions of the of the receiver. Uh, it turns out the antenna is this metal clip that goes all the way around it. Uh, when we were designing the pager, all of the technology at that time for an antenna used a, a, a ferrite core with a, with a loop, a, a ferrite core with a coil of wire around it. But that was heavy and took up a lot of space and we wanted something a little smaller. The uh, industrial design department had come up with the design of the thing with this nice little metal looking sleeve on it and I got to looking at it and I thought, oh, we might be able to figure out a way to use that as an antenna. And we did. Uh, and in fact, I have a patent on that. Uh, I'm sure it's run out by now, but, but uh, I did have a patent on it when they came out with it. This is my patent because that was the same idea as, as was envisioned in, in this particular patent. Um, the rest of the receiver this, this is one of the first engineering prototypes of it. It has uh, a lot of full little jumper wires on the back because, uh, because it was an engineering prototype and we were making changes. Uh, but the portion of, the, of it that I designed was the, uh, was the radio frequency portion here, a portion of it here, about two-thirds of the, of the radio. And I'll pass it around and let people, uh, let people take a look at it if they'd like. How do you think uh, uh, around the uh, the design work at that time was not computer driven. Uh, we had uh, we had some computer programs that did some circuit analysis, but most of the design work was done by uh, uh, trial and error on a, on a breadboard. Uh, the engineers actually worked at a bench with a with a soldering iron and, and test equipment and. Uh, and we actually uh, drew up ideas for circuitry and uh, breadboarded it, checked it out, modified it as we needed. Now the, that product also includes uh, several custom integrated circuits that, that we designed. The, our engineering group consisted of about eight, about eight engineers. And, uh, and uh, we designed everything in the radio, even the custom integrated circuits. Um, they were manufactured for us by Motorola's Semiconductor Products Division, which at the time was in Mesa, Arizona, out by, uh, out by Phoenix. And I had the opportunity to make a number of trips out there as we were working with the, with the production people out there to, to, to produce the, uh, the integrated circuits. When you patent a work that has been done with a group, 
-hmm. How would you patent that? Motorola, uh, the way they handle patents is, uh, is if, if uh, an engineer or his, or his uh, management felt that a, an idea was, uh, was unique enough that it was patentable, uh, you wrote up a little patent uh, disclosure that uh, got forwarded on to a, a committee that in later years I was on the committee uh, and it, it, it reviewed the patent applications, it looked at them from a technical standpoint, it also had some patent attorneys uh, to advise us and uh, they would look at, at what they thought, whether it was unique enough and was patentable, then the patent attorneys would actually write up the patent application, file it with the uh, uh, patent office, and go through the whole process of defending it and getting it actually issued. Would, pa would Motorola claim the patent for themselves? When you work for a large company, uh, you uh, sign an agreement at the beginning of your employment that anything you develop uh, that's related to, uh, to your work, uh, they own the patent rights to. Uh, and in fact, they met at the time, Motorola had a, had a program uh, where if you had a patent actually issued, uh, you received a $100 bonus. And you got invited to a patent awards banquet with some of the senior management once a year, and, uh, and, uh, and that was it. And the patent is good for, what, 28 years, I think. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all you get out of it, other than the fact that you get, get paid for, for working there and get the, all the benefits and everything. Uh, that was the first product I worked on. Uh, it was, that went into production in about 1971, 1972. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons we were the first engineering group to move to Fort Lauderdale was they had built a production facility in Fort Lauderdale and they were transferring all of the paging products production to, for, uh, to Florida uh, and the older products were being produced down there. Since this was a new product, they didn't want to introduce it into the, into the factory in Chicago and then have to reintroduce it into another factory in Fort Lauderdale. So they sent us down early and uh, as we were ready to put it into production, we introduced it into the factory in Fort Lauderdale from the very beginning. At the time, we were in a, in a small facility that was actually had been owned by IBM and that Motorola was renting off of IBM. Uh, and while we were, uh, while just before we uh, put this into full production, we moved into the new facility that they built that was a million square feet, I think, uh, out in, in Plantation, Florida, which is a suburb of, uh, of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but, but that created some interesting things too because to design an antenna, you can't very well do it in a lab. You have to do it in a, in a, in a, in a test site where you, where you don't have interference and it's an open field type test site. Uh, in Chicago, we had one. It was on the roof of the building. In Fort Lauderdale, we didn't have one. So as they were building the new facility, uh, they had the power company install a temporary power pole out in a field beside the, the side where they were building the plant. And they moved my workbench out there I worked on the final design of the antenna uh, out, uh, out, in the, out in the open field in Fort Lauderdale next to a, next to a detention pond that they had dug for the, for the new building. And uh, I got a good sunburn when we were doing that because we, we spent several months out there finishing the design. I had a technician that was working with me because it takes two people on an antenna site. But uh, I then moved on from that, uh, oh, I got promoted to engineering group later and moved on to a, to a product group that was designing a, a, a new two-way radio, uh, and I don't have a sample of it, but uh, I have a sales brochure for it. It was called the MX300. It, it, it went into production probably in about 1976, something in that neighborhood. Uh, and and I, uh, they had started working on it before I joined the group, but as we were finishing up most of the work on, on page 42, they decided they needed some more engineers uh, to help with some of the some of the work on the uh, on the uh, two-way radio on the MX300, and they transferred me down to that department. I worked on some of the circuitry that uh, involved what they called the PL, the private line circuitry, that has to do with the, the circuitry that allows the radio to access a repeater, and respond to a repeater without uh, without uh, uh, other other. Uh, users that were on the same frequency being able to hear each other. 
And I designed one of the integrated circuits in it, and I'll pass this around. This is a picture of one of the integrated circuits. Uh, it's actually, uh, this is the IC, but you see pieces of others beside it, because this was on a wafer. They, they manufactured monosilicon wafer at the time. It was a three inch diameter silicon wafer. And uh, these little points that you see on it are, are probe points. Uh, after, the, after the wafer is manufactured, and before they score it and break it, before they cut it apart, they actually have a machine that, that has little pinpoints that drop down, make connection to the various different pads, and actually test the circuitry to see if, uh, to see if it's a good, uh, a good uh, I drop a little ink, red ink dot on it, and then after they've tested all of them on the wafer, they score it and break it into the individual IC pieces, uh, and uh, uh, throw away the red ones and keep all the others. Uh, the actual size of this thing, this is a, I think this is a 101, 100 to 1 size uh, picture, if I, if I remember right on this one. Uh, so the real one would be one uh, hundredth One one hundredth of, of that, small. yes. Yes. Very small. And back then, they had the uh, technology to do this nano stuff? I mean... Uh, the technology has advanced considerably since then. In fact, I read over the weekend that the... The processor in the iPhone 6 has over a billion transistors in the one IC. That one, I think, had around 110 or 120 transistors is all. Uh, so the technology has advanced to the point that they can make each device smaller and smaller and smaller. And, uh, and as a result, can get, uh, can get a lot more on, uh, on one chip. And, uh, and of course, over the years, the technology has advanced considerably, and I'm sure that it is well beyond my <coughs> my memory. Uh, uh, one of the things that was being worked on at Motorola when I was uh, when I was still in Chicago was uh, was cellular telephones. In fact, my boss's boss, his name was Marty Cooper. And if you Google Marty Cooper, you'll find that he's considered to be the father of the cellular telephone. Uh, he was a. In fact, he was almost responsible for Page Boy Two never happening. He was, a, he was a very research-oriented type person. And about the time we would be ready to finalize the design, all of a sudden our boss would get a little note from him that said, hey, you know, I've been reading about this technology that's new that make it a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. Why don't you go see if you can incorporate that into Page Boy 2? And all of a sudden we'd be starting over again and <clears throat> with a little different, a little better, a little uh, newer technology. Uh, but at one point in time, finally, I guess they stood up to him and said, Marty, it's never going to happen if you, if you don't let us uh, go with what we've got. But anyway, he was the, he was the, the, the person who envisioned the, the, the uh, cell phone technology where you have multiple cells and as the phone moves from one site to another, the, the, the uh, telephone conversation is, uh, is uh, transferred from one cell site to the next cell site. And... Uh, when we were transferred to Fort Lauderdale, uh, he was still going to be in Chicago, and we, they, they had a big uh, going away banquet for us. And I never forget, he had a cell phone there. He had one that looked like this one, except the one he had had an umbilical cord on it, and down on the floor was a great big suitcase that had all the electronics in it. But he actually would, would make a telephone call with, uh, with that cell phone hooked to the uh, umbilical cord. And he told us at the time, and this would have been in 1970, he said, you know, he says, there will come a day when everyone in the world will have their own telephone number. And he said, uh, when you call them, if you can't get a hold of them, you'll know that either their batteries died or they've died. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he was uh, pretty close to accurate, I think. What I year saw was that? That would have been 1970. 1970. And some of the circuitry that we developed for Pageboy 2 is used in this first, this first, uh, first cell phone. This was the first production unit. That was a portable. Somehow or the other, I've lost the antenna. It had a little antenna that stuck on the top of it. But uh, this, this a lot of times they call this the brick. The brick. <coughs> I was at a class out at the high school here a few weeks ago talking about this, and uh, we were asking uh, uh, the students what uh, what that could be used for. And one of them said it was a weapon. <coughs> and that's, uh, that's that's probably pretty pretty much true. That one. Probably is not. I think the battery is dead, uh, but it it would work on the existing cell system now. Uh, it 
it's not a it's not a uh, 4G system or anything like that, uh, but it would work on, on the analog uh, cell system right now. You have a cell uh, phone to put it next to it. Well, I'm putting a cell phone next to it. <laughs> next to an iPhone? Yeah. <laughs> It's not an iPhone? Okay. Well, okay. Very good. Now, uh, this is the reason why they call it cellular phone, because of the cells. Yeah, the reason they call it cellular phone is there's, there's, a, there's a lot of little cells that, that, that uh, overlap each other. And they use different, in the cells that are adjacent to each other, they use different frequencies. But then they repeat those same frequencies when you get farther away. And, uh, and the system is all interconnected computerized in such a way that as, as the uh, person is moving from one cell to the other, it automatically senses the strongest signal from that particular telephone, switches to the cell tower that, uh, that gets the strongest signal, and then... Uh, Did you hear that? That was back then? Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that I might mention on that pager, uh, if you ever heard that, I don't have a battery that will make that one work, but if you ever heard, heard that one when, the, uh, when, when it was alerted, when it received a page, it was a beep, 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 beep page. It was the first product that used that kind of an alert tone. The earlier ones were a solid tone. And uh, we decided we wanted something that, that, that would uh, be a little bit more uh, noticeable than just a solid tone. So we settled on that, that, that particular tone and the repetition rate of it and the frequency of it came from Star Trek. That was, it was the same tone that the communicators made on Star Trek when they opened the, opened the communicator. Uh, and so we, uh, so we took liberties and stole it from Star Trek. It was Star Trek was popular at about that time. Now, I'm not sure if you are aware of this. Um, I'm not sure if so, um, James Bond that used uh, his shoe to put yeah. uh, a telephone in it and yeah. talk from the shoe or something. Yeah. I think that was... Uh, I think that was maybe looking uh, down the road a ways at technology when he did that. But yeah. that, that, that was ahead of technology. I think, I, so. Mean, I think so. So that brings another question. Mm -hmm. When we talk about um, science fiction, mm -hmm. how many of these science fictions became reality? It's, that's amazing, really. Uh, one, one that I know of very well because of the business that I was in before I, before I retired, I, I, I installed satellite receivers. Uh, satellites are in a ge geostationary orbit. They're, they're, they, they're uh, what, 22,300 miles above the Earth, and at that, at that point, uh, the velocity that they have to move in to remain in orbit is exactly the same as the orbital velocity of the Earth. And as a result, from any point on Earth, they appear to be stationary. They appear to never move. That's why a communication satellite works, and the dish can always be pointed at the same, in the same direction. That is called the Clark Satellite Belt. And the reason it's called the Clark Satellite Belt is back in, I think it was about 1948, the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clark predicted that if you could launch a device to 23,300 miles at the proper speed, it would never appear to move with respect to a given place on Earth. So that's a, a good example of where science fiction ended up predicting uh, what, uh, what technology finally uh, did. Finally, finally developed. What year was that? Approximately? I think it was 1948, if I remember right. The first predicted that. Okay. I think, I think that that's when it was. Now, the cellular technology is mm -hmm. still uh, valid in our phones today, or just the name? No, the cellular technology. It's the same technology now, except except it has developed because, in in, in fact, the uh, the original signals that were used on it were analog signals, and now it's now it's mostly all digital. Uh, in fact, a year ago, I saw an interview with Marty Cooper. He's still living. He's well into his 80s, I think. And he uh, he uh, retired from Motorola, and he owns a consulting firm out in California. Uh, but they were interviewing him, and they asked him uh, if he had ever envisioned uh, the cell phone uh, having, a, having a camera on it when, when he first developed it. And his response was, Back then, cameras used film. We, we never knew anything about a digital camera. He <laughs> says, in fact, the internet hadn't been developed, hadn't been invented yet. Yes. Uh, so it, it gives you a, a little bit of an idea as how, how the technology has changed so rapidly from the 
1970s to, to now, uh, you wouldn't know you wouldn't know the, uh, the same things that, that were developed back then. Now another question regarding the other side of the Atlantic, where um, I think Nokia or Nokia mm -hmm. would claim that they are the fathers and mothers of cell phones. How, how did you work with Motorola? Did they? I I think I th I think Motorola originally developed the the technology, uh, the system technology, but then but then a number of other companies started building the the telephone devices themselves. Okay. Uh, is how that is how that happened, and and over the years, uh, uh, some of the other companies have, have, have uh, uh, become uh, larger and more popular in the cellular telephone business than, than Motorola has. They kind of they kind of uh, kind of lost it just a little bit, I guess. <laughs> but uh, the things that I did with Motorola is I I, I first uh, worked with paging, and then I worked with the portable two-way radio group. In fact, I'll, I'll pass this brochure around to let you see a little bit about what that product was. I worked with that group, and then I got transferred to a, to a group that uh, was working, designing a product for the international marketplace. We were taking that product and designing it to meet uh, the international uh, specifications, particularly in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and it took uh, some modifications because some of the European countries had some, some different technical specs uh, than the United States. In some cases, they were stricter. Some places, they, they weren't quite so strict. Some of the frequency bands were different. Uh, so it, 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 it was basically the same product, but there were a lot of circuits that had to be, that had to be designed differently. Uh, and it would have been in about 1976, 77, that I took the first Motorola portable two-way radio to Germany and got it type approved by the German equivalent to our FCC, FCC or the FTZ in Darmstadt, Germany. We have a subsidiary in, uh, in Germany just outside of Wiesbaden, a little, little town called Taunusstein, West Germany. And uh, uh, I worked with the engineers over there to uh, uh, make sure it met the, uh, the specifications for Germany. Germany at the time had the strictest uh, specifications and the most difficult ones to meet of any other any European country. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I was at a patent awards dinner uh, as we were working on that product and getting close to finished. And I happened to be seated at the table with the CEO of Motorola. And he and my boss decided that they would, uh, they would, they would wager uh, that I would get that radio type approved at a, at a European, in a European country uh, before the product was announced in the United States. And we thought we had it figured out we were going to go to have it type approved in Luxembourg because Luxembourg was the easiest one to get type approved in. But the CEO was smart enough to know that Germany was the tightest one, and he decided that it was going to be Germany if we were to win the bet. <coughs> and when they, when they announced that product, they, they had shows at various places around the country to announce the product. The last show was being held in California. And I went to Germany the weekend before that show in California. I got it type approved the morning before the show uh, that it was to be announced at in California. So we, we considered that we had won the bet. We got it type approved before the announcement was, was completed in the United States. And, I, uh, I, and it was the first uh, Motorola two-way radio that had been type approved in Germany uh, ever. Uh, so, so it was a lot of fun. In fact, it was, it was really fun getting it type approved because I had gone to the FTZ with the radio with documentation of all the measurements that we've made on it with one of the engineers from the plant in Germany and uh, uh, we sat there while the, while, the, while the fellow from the FTZ did all the tests and repeated it. And uh, at one point in time, we went to lunch and came back and the engineer that was with me had to stop on the way back to the restaurant or something. Uh, we got back to the lab, and they had it in a temperature chamber with cables coming out of the te temperature chamber hooked to all their test equipment uh, so that they could test it at various different temperatures. And uh, at, up to this point, the, the fellow from Germany had never spoken English. I suspected he understood what I was saying, but he, but he required a title of the fellow to translate that all the time. And about that time, he pushed the wrong button on the, on the radio and started transmitting. Some of his equipment in, in such a 
away, he isn't going to burn up his equipment if he continues to say And in perfect English, he said to me, how do I turn it off? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I realized that well, he, uh, we could communicate whether he wanted to or not. And, uh, and anyway, it passed all the tests. He gave us the type approval number. We, we, we drove from Darmstadt back to Taunusstein on the Autobahn. And I noticed the speedometer was well over 160 kilometers as we were driving back. Uh, and uh, we sent a, at the time it had to be a telex, back to, back to uh, the United States, giving them the type approval number to prove that we had it type approved. I then went on to, to work on some more international products. Uh, now, what is a telex for people who run telex? It was, uh, it was like a teletype. Uh, uh, it was like email, but the common person didn't have uh, didn't have a terminal that he could uh, that he could use it on. There were terminals uh, like Motorola had one terminal in each in each facility, and, and it was at the same in the same department as the as the uh, uh, switchboard operator was. And when a when a telex would come in, it was a it was like a uh, dot matrix printer almost. It was an impact type printer, uh, and it. Printed out a row at a time, and they'd tear the paper off and hand deliver it to the person that it was supposed to go to. Uh, and that was that was the way we communicated. Back at, at that time, Motorola had just uh, installed a timeshare computer system that we were using in the labs, and they had a uh, they had a leased transatlantic cable to connect us to to the facilities in Germany and England and France. And there were a couple of the guys that worked for me that discovered there was a way that you could link terminals together and you could chat back and forth. And we, uh, we tied up the transatlantic cable quite a bit <coughs> uh, when we were working on that product, uh, chatting back and forth with the engineers in, in Germany. Uh, they found out about it and they decided they didn't like us to do that because that was using a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of bandwidth. But <coughs> soon after that, the email system uh, was developed. In fact, it was called the post system at the time. <laughs> And, uh, and we used that to communicate. I then went on to work on some more uh, uh, two-way radio products. We had a, I got transferred to the international division, but working on the same, same two-way radio in Florida, uh, we had a, uh, a contract with, uh, uh, at the time, and they don't exist anymore, Yugoslavia, which is <coughs> no longer Yugoslavia. Uh, the, uh, and, and we had to believe what they were going to use the radios for. Uh, it was in a special frequency band called midband, which does not is not licensed in the United States for two-way radio use. And uh, uh, what we were told they were going to use the radios for is they were going to take the radios and they were going to issue them to farmers in Yugoslavia. One of the problems they had was uh, 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 the, the rain never fell at the right time for the crops. And they were going to issue these radios to the farmers, and they were going to issue silver iodide rockets to the farmers. And, and the weather forecasters said that it was time to seed the clouds to make it rain where they wanted it to rain. They would get on these radios and call the farmers and tell them to fire off their, their silver iodide rockets in a certain direction. That was the story we were given, and we, uh, we weren't allowed really to question it. They were going to buy the radios, so we were designing the radios for them. And, uh, and we... Uh, we designed them. We built them. It was a it was a penalty contract that we had to have it in their hands by a certain date, and uh, uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons that I got promoted to product manager because <coughs> one of the nice things about being in the international division at that time was I was in Fort Lauderdale. I didn't work for any of the people that were in that plant in Fort Lauderdale. My boss was in Chicago, and as a result, I could pretty well do what I decided I needed to do to make things happen. And one of the problems that we always had. That, that particular two-way radio product, they always had a shortage of products to meet the production needs. And when we got ready to build our pilot run, I, I went to the material control department and convinced one of, the, one of the people, one of the analysts in there to be transferred into my department so he could key the purchasing people to buy the, buy, buy the parts specifically for our, for our product. And one day, the uh, he came into me and he says, the parts have come in, they've cleared incoming inspection, what stock room do they go to? <coughs> and I said, I don't want them to go in the other stock room or so they'll get taken up by the, uh, by the other product line. So I said, gee, my office is big enough, I think we could store them right here. So we locked them up in my office 
And a few weeks later, the plant was in big crisis. They'd shut down the production line. They didn't have enough of some of the common parts to, to fill some orders. And, and uh, my boss's boss from Chicago called me and he says, uh, I understand you've got 300 sets of parts kind of hidden away. And I said, yeah. I said, uh, we've got a penalty contract and I'm not going to give up my parts. And he said, well, he said, would you give them 50 sets? So they talked me into giving up 50 sets of my parts to the other group. And the other group, they weren't very happy with me, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's, the way, uh, that's the way it worked. I then got transferred back to Schaumburg in 1977. And uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was working. I, I, the, the group that was in Florida still reported to me. And, and I had an engineering group, an electrical engineering group, and a mechanical engineering group, and a marketing group reporting to me in, in Schaumburg. They were designing a new uh, mobile two-way radio for the international marketplace. And uh, uh, we were working, we were designing it in such a way that we were working a lot with a lot of the finance people to determine where the best place was to, to build the product because it, it was a it was a kind of a combination economic, uh, cost accounting, and engineering uh, problem because uh, a lot of the products were going to be uh, sold in Europe, some of them were going to be sold in Canada, some of them were going to be sold uh, in Australia, all over the world. And the trick was to try to determine how many you were going to sell in each one of the countries what it cost as far as duties to move the product back and forth from one a country to another, what it would cost if you moved the raw material to a, to a particular country and built it there and then shipped it to other countries. And the one, the one restriction we had was that we were only going to build it in one place. We were only going to build it in each one of the countries. And we, we uh, had finally decided that we were going to build it at a, at a facility that we owned in, in Canada, just outside of Toronto. And uh, as a result, my group was doing a lot of traveling back and forth to Toronto to get that product into production. And uh, I left Motorola before that product was in production. But at the time, I had responsibility for the products that we were developing in the United States, plus the products that were being custom customized by the engineering groups in the various subsidiaries. We had the one in Taunerstein, Germany. We had one in Basingstoke, England. We had one in France. We had one in we had one in uh, in Canada. We also had one in, in Japan, but I didn't deal an awful lot with it. And we had one in South Africa. I didn't deal an awful lot with it. But I spent a good deal of time, and that's kind of probably one of the reasons that I decided to come back to Charleston. I uh, I was doing a lot of traveling. I was I was spending a lot of time in in Germany, England, and Canada. In fact, the last year I was there, uh, I would spend about uh, two or three days a month in Florida, and um, every week, about two days in Canada, and then about every month, uh, a week over in, uh, over in either Germany or England. And uh, that, was, uh, that was kind of fun in the beginning, but that kind of got old. At the time, my son was, uh, was uh, five years old, and, and uh, every time I left the country for a week, he, uh, he seemed to get sick, and we decided that that <coughs> was not the, not the way to continue. And as a result, I decided, you know, <coughs> The, uh, the big company was nice. I learned a lot. I would, uh, I would, uh, I would do it again if I had, was starting over. But, uh, but I had also learned what I wanted to learn and done what I wanted to do and seen what I wanted to see and decided it was time to come back home. So I did. Big decision. decision. Well, uh, I know we can leave you for five hours to talk about these things. But uh, if you have any questions from the floor here, uh, we want to hear from India, from Saudi Arabia, from America, from Iran, from Nigeria. We are quite an international group here. So who will start? Let me start first by asking you. Sure. Have you thought about writing a book about these things? I don't know that it would be of interest to anybody, really. I will um, buy the first two you books. Would you? A lot of the a lot of the experiences that I had, there were an awful lot of people that had very similar experiences, uh, uh, and and uh, and the technology has changed so much in the last uh, in the last forty years that uh, that uh, I don't know I don't know how, how much of a, how much value it would be. I mean, we hear about Mr. Newton and Mr. Uh, Graham Bell and other people back then, and we see how technology was. So I think it would be valuable. <laughs> So, any other questions? Questions or comments? Yes, here, and uh, this is for uh, 
two things that were stuck in here. So would you would you describe developing kind of breaking or, or I guess cutting edge consumer electronics as controlled chaos? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, it, uh, it, uh, well, I don't know really. We, we, uh, we were not under a lot of pressure. Uh, we, uh, it was more get it done and do it right. Uh, but there were times when, uh, when uh, upper management would be frustrated with the fact that we were spending a lot of money on engineering and didn't have anything to show for it yet. So, so that, that's true with all development. That's right. Uh, but uh, 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 no, we just came in every morning and worked for the end of the day, and, and uh, came back the next morning and worked some more until we got it. <laughs> Another one. Yeah. Um, where is the position of uh, pagers right now? Because I see that in hospitals, doctors used to use the pager mm -hmm. to communicate. So right now, it is just the only usage of uh, pagers. You know, I'm not so sure. I think the aging business has probably uh, has probably been reduced considerably, if there's much of it that exists anymore at all, because uh, the pager, uh, Page Boy 2, and, and all of the pagers up until just a few years ago were a one-way communication device. Uh, uh, there were two basic versions. There was a tone-only version that that uh, it would beep, and when it beeped, you knew you were to call a predetermined telephone number to get your message. Or there was a tone and voice version that would beep, and then there would then the caller could leave a voice message for you. Uh, but you couldn't communicate back. You had to go to a telephone to communicate back. And then there was a time that they came out with some two-way pagers that had the capability to transmit back a very rudimentary uh, 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 one uh, couple of indications, like a yes or a no, or a, or something like that. Uh, but as the cellular telephone business grew, uh, the need for a pager pretty well, uh, pretty well disappeared. Uh, in fact, a lot of times you're, you can use your cellular telephone as a pager because when you get kicked to voicemail, it asks if you want to uh, leave a number for them to call back or, not, or something. And when, when you do, you hear the beep on the cell phone and, and you read the phone number to call back. So. So uh, the, the pagers have pretty well, pretty well outlived their, their, their usefulness, I think. There was a question here. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the history of Motorola, like the genesis. Do you know much about the very beginning? Yeah, a little bit about it. The, uh, the name of the, uh, there were really two, two people who, who were the founders of Motorola. Uh, one of them was, uh, his name was Paul Galvin. And the other one, I don't know his first name, but his last name is Lear. He's the man who later became known for the Lear Jet. <coughs> they, uh, what they did was, uh, it was back in the 1930s, I believe. Uh, uh, radio was, was there, and they decided that the, the police needed to have a way to, to be dispatched. <coughs> so they developed a, a radio for, uh, for, for police officers. In fact, at that point in time, there had never been radios in cars. They hadn't made any car radios yet. The radios were big vacuum tube type things that had to plug into the electrical outlet, and had to have an outside antenna and all kinds of things. Um, they decided that they would find a way to, to, to make a radio that could be mounted in a, in a vehicle. And, uh, and the first thing they did was, was put it on a, a, a fixed frequency, and then they set it up so that uh, a police dispatcher could transmit on that frequency. And again, it was a one-way type thing, but they could tell the police officers, dispatch them to where they were supposed to go. They didn't know whether they'd gotten there, they didn't know whether they'd gotten the message or not, but they would, they would transmit it out. And, uh, uh, and, and in fact, that's how the name Motorola came to be. It was a, the motor had to do with a motor vehicle, and uh, uh, the Rolla part of it was radio. It was kind of a contraction of it. Uh, and, uh, and that's, how, that's how the company started back in the, uh, back in the 30s. And then as the technology developed, it, uh, it moved more into the uh, transmit and receive capabilities. Uh, they expanded. At one point in time, there was a consumer electronics division that made televisions and radios with the Motorola name on them. Uh, and uh, I think they sold that in 
70s, late 60s to, uh, to uh, Matsushita Electric of Japan, and it, it carried the Quasar name for a number of years after that. Uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, they, they expanded into the two-way radio business, and as, as the technology grew, they, they, they changed, uh, changed with it. The, uh, Paul Galvin uh, had a son who, uh, his name was Bob Galvin, who was, this, who was the CEO at the time I was at Motorola, and, uh, um, and I've kind of lost track since then, but there have been several CEOs since then. I think, I think well, Bob, uh, Paul has long since died, and I think Bob has died. I think maybe there was a time that uh, his son named Chris Galvin uh, was in one of the management positions at Motorola, uh, but then they brought some, some other people that weren't in the family uh, on any of the management positions. And they, they grew and they expanded into a lot of things. They had the semiconductor products division. They had uh, auto products division that they made uh, various things for, for uh, the automotive market. Some of the some of the electronic ignition systems and things like that. Very good. Now, did you have anything to do, or Motorola has to do with NASA and the space? Uh yeah. In fact, in fact, uh, Motorola made the first uh, the first car radio on the moon. What it was called, but the little vehicle that they took to the moon that they that they that they rode on had a had a two-way radio in it that Motorola that Motorola designed and manufactured. Very good, very good. Any other questions? Where is India? Yes, another one here. How has your engineering background helped you in your political life, and how would you <laughs> say it's hurt you in your political life? <coughs> I don't know that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I suppose it gave me the training to, to think logically, think analytically. Uh, uh, beyond that, uh, the engineering technical knowledge is not used anymore other than the fact that I, I, I do when, uh, when somebody's trying to sell the police department or the fire department a new two-way radio, I kind of get involved in a little bit of analysis to determine whether I think it's a, it's a, it's a good product or, or, a, or, or worth the money. But uh, other than that, oh, I suppose it gave me the, uh, the ability to, to, uh, to uh, defend my, my, uh, my thoughts and my, uh, my uh, designs and things uh, publicly. Uh, one of the things that Motorola always had every year they had an engineering product review where the engineers had to get up and talk to the upper management and present their designs and their products and kind of defend them. And there was a, there was one particular upper manager who had a habit of uh, of uh, really uh, making you think on your feet. One of them, uh, one of the one of the, his big pet peeves was uh, with the mechanical engineering department. He was not happy with them because they would always design uh, radios that the, the, the fasteners or the screws that held the covers on and everything were not captured. They came loose. <coughs> and he would sit there in the back of the room <coughs> and take one of the prototypes apart. And then he would uh, take all the screws and he would throw them across the room and he'd ask the four engineers that were standing up there, how are you going to put the thing back together again? And, uh, <coughs> and uh, as a result, you learned, uh, you learned uh, how to... How to uh, Anticipate the kinds of questions that were going to come up, and how to, uh, how to how to how to think on your feet and deal with it. So managing a city like a mayor, uh, I mean, it's helped by managing a project. Managing. Well, I think uh, so because I had uh, I had uh, uh, several layers of management working for me. And by the time I left Motorola as the product manager, I had a an engineering manager and a market man marketing manager, two of the, uh, one marketing manager and two engineering managers reporting to me. Each one of them had, uh, the engineers had engineering section managers and they had engineering group leaders reporting to them. I had, I had a head count of, I think around 150 people indirectly reporting, reporting to me. What's the difference between being a mayor and a governor? A mayor and a governor. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the big differences is the mayor deals with the people, uh, the citizens, a lot more. Uh, if you 
got a question for the governor or a comment for the governor, it's pretty hard for you to get to contact him and talk to him directly. But I have a lot of people call me on the phone or email me or see me on the street or ask me a question or talk to me. So the mayor is, uh, works a lot more closely with the, uh, with the individual uh, citizens. A mayor in New York or a mayor of Chicago is higher in rank than a governor in a smaller state? Well, I don't know. He probably, he probably has more people that, uh, that he's responsible for than a governor in, a, in small states. And from that standpoint, he maybe is a more, uh, has more influence than a governor in a small state. But, but, uh, and by the time you get to uh, large cities like Chicago or New York or Los Angeles, uh, the mayors, I would guess, in those cities are, are are more like a governor with respect to the individual citizens as far as the their their, their access to the to the to the mayor is concerned. The uh, the mayor in in Charleston we have the city manager form of government, so we have a city manager that all of the uh, all of the department heads report to the city manager. The city manager reports to the city council, and the city council is made up of the mayor and four council members, and uh, and we're more of a policy-making body than than a, than a day-to-day -day managing body. Uh, one of the reasons for that is under the previous form of government that Charleston had, the commission form of government, uh, each each uh, uh, city council member was responsible for a department. One would be responsible for the fi finance department. One for Public Works Department, one for Fire Department, and so on. And the problem you always had in, in that kind of a situation was each one of the council members was elected by the people, so he was pretty well autonomous, and he set his policies for his department, and they were not always consistent from one department to another, or when the need arose to, uh, that one department had a heavier workload than another, and the, the individual needed to remove some uh, worker transferred from one department to another, <coughs> it was pretty difficult to make that happen, but under the city manager form of government, since all of them report to the city manager, he could make those kinds of decisions, he had consistent policies and all those kinds of things. And it's much more efficient, saved the city a lot of money when we changed to that form of government, and we changed about 17 years ago. Uh, the mayor, on the other hand, does get involved with more day-to-day -day activities than, than one might think. Uh, a lot of times people will have a question or a complaint, but they'll want to talk to the mayor. They won't want to talk to the city manager or anybody else. They'll want to talk to the mayor, and he ends up kind of being a referee sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the police department works under your... The police department actually reports directly to the city manager, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the city manager is the only one in the, in the city that can be hired and fired by the city council. However, the city manager uh, tends to tends to want to keep the, the mayor and the city council happy. So uh, there's an awful lot of times that, uh, that I, I communicate directly with the police department. One responsibility that the mayor has in the state of Illinois that is different than anybody else in the city is the mayor is the liquor commissioner. So the mayor is the one who issues liquor license, is the one who, who disciplines the liquor license holders if, uh, if they, if they break the law or violate the rules, he holds the hearings, he determines what the punishment will be for him, uh, and as such, I can go to the police department and tell them that this weekend I want to have a compliance check in the bars, and they'll, and they'll, they'll do it. Uh, the other thing is because a lot of times if there's a, something that happens that, uh, that's uh, out of the ordinary or something that would be newsworthy that would concern people, <clears throat> Since a lot of times the mayor is the one that's going to get the call from the press to know what's going on, the police department keep me uh, keep me informed. I have I have one of their two-way radios that I that I carry with me, so uh, I can I can I can communicate that with them, and they can communicate with me, and I get text messages uh, whenever something's going on. Uh, and, uh, and I got free reign to the police department. We've got all our all our doors in city hall electronically things. And, my fob will get into any of them, uh, so I can talk about anybody. And in New York, I think the mayor was the one who said, uh, drink Coca-Cola or no Coca-Cola. 
Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how that works. <laughs> I would I would think that the city council would have some authority in that, but uh, somehow or the other, he, he made that decision. Well, uh, the mayor came for 10 to 15 minutes <laughs> and five minutes questions, and now we took much, uh, I mean, three times of his time. Uh, you have any questions or comments to the mayor of Charleston, and the mic will come to you. Well, okay. I think we can uh, give a warm thank you to our mayor. Well, thank you. <coughs> I really